Good morning, everyone. Welcome to IFA's Global Cafe. My name is Bruna Suertz. I'm Director of Communication Strategy. And it is my pleasure to host today's session. We have a uh, well, very promising and lively discussion ahead of us. Uh, before we join, I just wanted to let you know that this session is being recorded. You will find a recording uh, posted under IFA's website right after this session. For more information, we will post um, links and bios in the chat. You can use the chat function uh, below on your screen to post any questions. Those will be moderated by uh, Urveshi Rathod, our, our today's moderator for the session. And um, we, we I think we are ready to start. I'll hand it over to Urveshi. Thank you so much, Bruna, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to this week's IFA Global Cafe in conversation with experts. My name is Urvashi Rothward, Project Officer with the International Federation on Aging, and I'm honored to be moderating today's Global Cafe. With the rise in isolation amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, organizations such as Mosaic in 880 cities have adopted asset-based community development to encourage equitable community engagement and socialization, especially among older people, protecting the right to mobility and providing the ability to age in place. To share their extensive experience in applying a community integrated model of care that addresses the clinical, personal support and wider non-clinical psychosocial needs of the person, we have with us today, Ms. Jane Teasdale, and Ms. Jane Armstrong will be leading a discussion on person-centered care and the Seniors Outdoor Activation Toolkit. Ms. Teasdale is well known for developing awareness of home and healthcare issues in the community and for encouraging collaboration between public and private entities in Ontario's greater Toronto area. Mosaic Home Care and Community Resource Centers offer a person-centered community integrated model of care that is unique to the home care industry. It also operates a community resource center in Toronto that provides information, education, events, space for hobby groups, community and memory cafes and much more. Ms. Teasdale has spent many years in presenting on community-based models of care to hospitals, community agencies, social workers and conferences run by organizations such as the European Society of Person-Centered Healthcare UK. I'm going to also introduce Ms. Armstrong so they can transition seamlessly between the presentation. Ms. Armstrong joined 880 Cities in 2021 after graduating from the Master of Science in Planning at the University of Toronto. She's a project manager mm -hmm. who leads the planning, design, and implementation of targeted outreach events and activities to ensure equitable engagement with communities that might not otherwise participate. Ms. Teasdale and Ms. Armstrong, thank you very much for being with us today. I look forward to being a part of the conversation. The floor is now yours. <clears throat> thank you. Um, so I will start. Thank you everyone for having us this morning. Um, like uh, Irvishi introduced, my name is Jane Armstrong. I'm presenting with Jane Teasdale today. And we're talking about person-centered care and the Seniors Outdoor Activation Toolkit. But first, a quick run through the agenda. We're going to introduce ourselves, introduce the overarching goal of this presentation. Um, we're going to introduce Mosaic's work on community mapping. I'll talk about asset mapping and the Seniors Outdoor Activation Toolkit. Jane will take it away with social prescribing and we'll come together at the end for a takeaway message after we have some questions. So first, like Urvashi said, my name is Jane. I'm a project manager here at 880 Cities. And 880 Cities is a not-for-profit organization based in Toronto. Our mission is to improve the quality of life for people living in cities and communities of all sizes, no matter age, ability, or socioeconomic status. And we are guided uh, by a simple, but we think powerful question. What if everything we did in our cities was great for an eight-year-old and an 80-year-old? And we took this sentiment and we applied to the, uh, the New Horizons for Seniors program grant. It's a federal grant with the goal of making a difference in seniors' lives. So while we are focused on the age-friendly lens, the 880 as our name implies, we, know, we knew we needed to have a local partner if we were to make a real grassroots impact. 
So in the New Horizons for Seniors grant application, we partnered with Wood Green Community Services um, and we our end product was the Seniors Outdoor Activation Toolkit that I will jump into a little later on in the presentation. So first I thought I'd introduce the overarching goal of introducing both of our organizations, so 880 Cities and Mosaic. And the point of this is to show the dynamic power of collaborating and co-creating pandemic resilient programs with the communities you serve and to provide tips for implementation within your own organization or community. So a little introduction to how Jane and I know each other. We met at the seniors accountability table with the C uh, city of Toronto. Um, I was working on the toolkit and needed to do research for the toolkit on how grassroots seniors organizations like Jane's organization Mosaic, I needed to know how they work with the community and how the toolkit could best benefit them. So Jane was wondering about permits and programming in public spaces, which is a very difficult task for many. Um, it's not an easy process. So we took this concern and we addressed it, these roadblocks in the toolkit. We had a few chats, we came together, uh, Jane's insights informed the toolkit, and this is why we're here today. So I'd love to pass it off to Jane to do an introduction of herself and then uh, speak about her presentation. Yes, thank you everyone. So I, I, I guess my role in the company is Director of Business Development and also I'm co-owner uh, with my business partner, Natalie Anderson. We've uh, been running Mosaic for 12 years now. Um, we started with resource centers and social programming, uh, which is much different than the average um, medical model of home care. So we wanted to do more within the community. Uh, so we did do some work on micro mapping. And what we wanted to do with this was find out from our clients. So we start with the person-centered care model, which is embedded within our model of care. Um, and then what we want to do with our social worker and our client services liaison, and also our, um, our community person that is working with us now, is to try and find out within a radius of about a one kilometer radius with our clients and find out what things um, are in their local neighborhood. Um, so this was done actually at an event in Scarborough where we had everyone at the tables and we opened the discussion with um, social engagement, the importance of that, uh, speaking on isolation as well. And we had everyone do a map of their local area. And what we wanted to find was what things did they go to? Uh, did they know about the bumping places uh, where you bump into people for conversation or coffee house or town square or, or local park? Um, and do you know your neighbors and how many and how well? And does your neighborhood hold regular get togethers? So these are the things that we were looking at. Um, and then would you call your neighborhood a close community? And to find out the answers, you might want to map your walkable area. Obviously, this is more for an urban area, but there might be things um, that people would pick up more for a rural area or different parts around the world. In, in Europe, there's local squares where people come together. Um, you know, in the countryside, there might be like knitting groups or um, walking clubs or so forth. So it's also, I think, about finding out and having meaningful conversations with people around you to find out what kind of programs are starting up. It's not just through local community agencies, but we find that people within communities are starting their own walking clubs, um, coffee clubs, uh, meeting at the libraries, uh, going for walks, sitting in the parks. Um, so all these things you need to look at within your walkable area. And this also helps family caregivers as well. Um, because what happens is once they start looking after, you know, a family member or a partner is that they stop doing the things that they enjoy, their interests and hobbies. So this also benefits this work um, to help family caregivers as well. Uh, so how do you do it? So, you know, you can get a piece of paper, draw the boundaries and fill in the places you go to. And your area may be 500 uh, meters to either side and for others a bit bigger. And once you have mapped your area, think about the places you go to and ask yourself, how can you engage and what is happening in your community? So do not uh, ignore your immediate neighborhood. Uh, research into social media contacts has shown that 50% of contacts come within a one kilometer radius. 
and your local neighborhood could be an important source of social connection and support. And make a note of local resources, interests, activities, park, parks, and people you know and connect. So some of the ideas that we had, we actually had a resource center, one of them, which is in a mall setting. So again, using spaces and community assets and collaboration is key. Um, and, you know, this is discussed all through the IFA about collaboration and integration. Uh, so we had wonderful uh, social programs and this brought all ages together. We had school children coming out and music and theater and puppetry and all sorts of things going on in a mall. And what else happens in the community? So with different organizations, we're doing different things. There could be festive teas, creative workshops for care partners and loved ones, interactive brain health, walking and fall prevention, yoga, historical society talks, singing and dancing events. And you know, there's so much happening within the community. And obviously over COVID, we had to work very fast to have things online in a COVID environment. Um, so we've run hundreds of events online and we've kept those people engaged as well within our communities. Um, we are evidence informed. So, I mean, there's been a lot of work on person-centered care and social prescribing. So we've looked at some of the work of John Kaki, the late John Kakiopo and also Robin Dunbar as well. Thank you, Jane. Um, so when Jane is talking about festive teas and events and where people meet and bumping places, we see these as assets. So to find out, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> to find out what people value, we believe the first step is asset mapping. And asset mapping is to uncover individual, cultural, organizational, and physical assets. This was the first step in our project uh, of the, that culminated in the Seniors Outdoor Activation Toolkit. So just to give you a brief introduction on what the toolkit is, and then we'll get into the asset mapping. So the Seniors Outdoor Activation Toolkit tells the story of a partnership between Wood Green Community Services and 880 Cities and over 100 seniors who saw the COVID-19 pandemic as an opportunity to flip the standard for seniors programming in parks and public spaces. So the standard for seniors programming pre-pandemic largely relied on indoor classes. So when the pandemic hit and indoor gatherings were no longer possible, we had to look to outdoor public spaces to keep seniors active and socially connected. While this is pretty logical of a next step, in Toronto, especially in the east side, there's a paucity of high quality, accessible and age-friendly public spaces. So the Seniors Outdoor Activation Toolkit is both the means to point this out and advocate for better investments in senior-friendly spaces, and to lead with the idea that outdoors can indeed be safe, comfortable and joyous places for seniors to recreate and to connect with one another. So through the grant, we had funding to do programming in public space, but we wanted to ensure that the programmings were culturally relevant and safe and co-created with seniors, which capitalizes on all the assets we, that we've uncovered. So using Wood Green's network of seniors, we held dozens of interviews and focus groups to uncover individual and cultural assets. The people we spoke to gave us insight on what it means to be a senior during the pandemic and what would it take for them to feel safe, comfortable and sociable participating in programming that we were looking to trial. So in conversations with seniors, we uncovered two main assets, individual and cultural. An individual is referencing the relationships and the existing networks that seniors already had amongst one another that were virtually cut off at the start of the pandemic. But we knew that these were strong social connections that would become strong assets if we played off of them. We also know that Wood Green services a very culturally diverse group of seniors, and we know that cultural ties were already running very deep. So we knew that if we were to have a successful program, we had to make all of our programmings culturally relevant. We had to, um, in terms of communication, rely on these cultural networks to promote and to share the word amongst one another as well. And of course, when we think of assets, we think of physical assets, probably first and foremost. So in our interviews and focus groups, we ask questions to seniors like, what do you need from public space? Of course, benches, shade, but also how far are you willing to walk slash take the bus to a program? What are your individual accessibility needs and concerns? And we heard about grass versus paving, types of paving that are more accessible and not. Um, 
various ages of seniors as well. We spoke to 85 plus, we spoke to 50 plus to get a range of different ideas of access and accessibility. So we took all of those um, needs from public space and uh, we looked for public spaces that meet the needs of seniors. But like I said, in Toronto, especially in the East End, there's a paucity of high quality accessible seniors places. So we took the idea of walkability or you know, uh, length of time willing to take the bus and we drew a big radius around uh, Wood Green's programming buildings. That's the seniors that we spoke to already pretty familiar in uh, accessing. So we took all of that um, in addition to the individual and organizational assets and cultural assets to see what parks and public spaces are relevant. So uh, we whittled it down to quite a few parks um, that we ended up having to repurpose. So we repurposed covered ice rinks, dormant in the summer into shaded oases for senior Zumba classes. We transformed an old shuffleboard slab here into an accessible space for a drum circle. So we had to be super creative with the parks and public spaces that we had at our disposal. Um, it was rather difficult at the start of the pandemic to find spaces that work for seniors that were accessible in all the terms that we uncovered, uh, but we managed to find a few. So part of the toolkit is also pointing to that struggle that we had very difficult to find seniors friendly public spaces according to the needs of seniors identified by themselves but we pushed through <laughs> and we hosted a bunch of classes so zumba chair yoga drum circle pole walking and instructor training uh, which is referencing that we enrolled a handful of seniors into pole walking training so that they could use their own cultural and organizational assets to lead their own pole walking classes a little later on we purchased poles um, and we've been starting a lending library in which seniors can take out polls, the ones that are now instructed to be trainers, uh, and they can lead their own individual poll walking classes. So just another way to do uh, pandemic resilient programming. We also did healing dance. And like I said, we're building out the library currently, the lending library. So all of our findings uh, and the ways in which we spoke to seniors, we evaluated public space and evaluated the program are all included in the Seniors Outdoor Activation Toolkit, <clears throat> as you can see here, tools one, two, and three. So I would encourage you all to check this out. Um, I will put a link into the chat with the toolkit and um, I'm gonna pass it off to Jane before we get into questions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about social prescribing and social prescriptions. Um, so social prescribing, for those that don't know, is developed um, it's more of a holistic approach to healthcare that brings together the social and medical models of health and wellness. And the social prescriptions is, is from the writer or a, a professional or a social worker or a doctor that would write prescriptions for people um, to make links to other organizations or activities within the communities. Um, so this is really important. I think this is a change that is happening within Canada. In the UK, it's actually social prescribing for the UK members. Um, it started in the UK in 1990. And now uh, BC is actually doing a lot of work on social prescribing and now Toronto there's a movement and we have the Alliance for Healthcare, Healthier Communities and also the Canadian Institute of Social Prescribing. So they've been doing quite a bit of work. Um, these are just some examples of social prescriptions and connections to activities uh, that Mosaic has been working on and using open spaces. So this was held at a park at High Park, which is in Toronto, a lovely park. And again, it's about connection and collaboration. Uh, we are a private organization, so we, we do not receive funding for the programs. Um, so we do work with other organizations or retirement homes that, get, that can help with some of the programming and, you know, either provide the food or um, just working together to create these type of programs. Um, so it's a lot of, you know, back and forth in creating these and, and thinking um, and using surveys that we've collected from, from our members and from people that have attended our programs to see what they're interested in. And also taking in, you know, just thinking about, are there park benches where we're going? Is it easy to walk? How far is the walk? Um, shade, 
um, refreshments. So you're having to think about all these things when you're running these type of programs. So Emma Rooney is actually a horticulturist and she's going to be doing another program for us on forest bathing, which actually started in Japan. It's called Hiran, Hiran Yuko. And um, actually BC has been doing a lot of forest bathing. And it's also to help with people with anxiety or depression. And these are walks in the park and being with nature. And actually a lot of places in the UK, I noticed some of the hotels in the UK and the country are now having that as part of their programs. And I think even some places in Canada now. Um, Walk the Region, this was quite an interesting program that we partnered with uh, the SUMAC, which is the Chartwell, so we worked together on this. It also included residents and also community members. This was open to any age, so this is not just a seniors program, and it's, it's about collaboration and different ages coming together. Um, so we used Natalie Prezzo, which is a local author. And she has written books about timed walks around the city, which links interesting places uh, within Toronto and coffee shops and so forth. So she was the one that developed the tour. And uh, then we sort of provided lunch and so forth. So when you're talking about collaboration and, and working together, you know, it's, it's everybody working together on that program. And uh, so this is how it sort of helps with the fees and, and running the programs. Excellent. Thanks, Jane. Thank so uh, our last few slides are takeaway messages, but I think we'll pause for questions. Thank you, Ms. Teasdale and Ms. Armstrong for this inspiring discussion. First and foremost, I want to recognize that isolation and heightened fear of being in close contact indoors have been a widespread consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. Repurposing outdoor dormant spaces to address this fear and provide an opportunity <coughs> for socialization has challenged the norm that older people are too frail to go outside. This adaptive reuse of spaces has provided the ability for older people to age in place and support the right to mobility, which is in alignment with the work and the vision of the IFA. Interesting to know, Ms. Teasdale and Ms. Armstrong have not recreated the wheel on person-centered care model. Rather, they have integrated it into private home care settings and other communities, which is quite rare. So it is essential to recognize these bodies of work. And I want to congratulate both Ms. Teasdale and Ms. Armstrong. While questions are trickling in from participants, I would like to begin by posing my question. So there's so much innovation and many new technologies such as transitioning to virtual or hybrid programs, which has witnessed a rise over the past couple of years. However, there are various barriers that prevent the use of technology, especially for older people. So what barriers have Mosaic and 880 cities experienced and what practices have you implemented to make your programs more accessible? I guess I can start it off. Yes, it, it, it has been quite difficult, uh, you know, before we would have our programs in our resource centers. Uh, so people would obviously attend if attended if they could, um, but we didn't touch upon the people that couldn't get out and that had a disability. Um, so they were not able to attend unless they had um, somebody to drive them um, or wheel trans or so forth. Then COVID hit and then we had to very quickly, very quickly, um, uh, start the Zoom. And we also had to spend a lot of time, provide information to people who had iPads and how to use Zoom. So there was a lot of work put into that conversation. I mean, we have a community resource and social engagement person. Um, so she was in charge of that. Um, spent time with individuals, helping them online, we also uh, provided our newsletter, which went out quarterly, which we had that information. Um, for people that didn't have um, Zoom or iPads, um, what we did was with the members, we, we flagged those individuals that we knew um, couldn't make it online. And we would be making phone calls to them and having conversations with them. How can we help them? Is there any other organizations we can link them to? Um, 
And then now it's like even more work because you're working, things are opening up now. So you're having some in-program classes and then still uh, doing things on Zoom and then working out how you're going to do a hybrid model and how is that going to work? Do you have the technology within your organization to do that? So those are some of the things that we had to work through as an organization. Thank you. Maybe I'd like to just add, um, we heard that the majority of uh, Wood Green's clientele actually heard about our programming through word of mouth. It was like 68% of people who responded, who attended it, heard about it through their networks. So while we know social media is super important um, and we know that Wood Green has iPad lending programs and tech teaching classes, regardless, still the majority of seniors hear about it through word of mouth. So uh, capitalizing on those cultural assets, those individual assets that, that, they, that they already have, uh, nothing beats like a good old flyer and a phone call uh, and they'll do the programming and promotion for you. At least that's what we found. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you so much. I would like to now move on to questions from our audience. So first of all, to Mr. Shmuel, um, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, of course. You hear me? Yes, I do. Thank okay, you. okay. I want to ask, to ask you next, uh, and according to me, very actual question. Uh, I want uh, to ask you what, according to you, opportunities and uh, challenges uh, created the COVID-19 pandemic uh, for a person uh, centered uh, care in uh, other uh, people. Thank you, Shmal. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, first of all, person-centered care within creating a model within private care, it is very complex. You also have to have the staff and client services and social workers and nurses as part of that integrated team. A lot of home care agencies don't have the capacity to do that or the knowledge to do that. So we've spent a lot of years in implementing that and it has become our culture. Um, uh, so we do have a client services liaison and they work with the PSWs within the homes. Um, definitely over covid it's you know we we had to do that when we're doing assessments we're looking at the person as a whole first what is the person's interests and hobbies what are their goals uh, and then we look at the medical issue so we're doing a medical assessment first to find out how we can help them um, and also doing a lot of training and orientation with our personal support workers on our model of person-centered care so it's continuous within an organization and the culture. It's not just saying we're doing person-centered care. Okay, what does that look like? It's actually embedded. And a lot of time takes, uh, you know, in, in order to do that and cost as well. But, you know, I think families do appreciate it. And, you know, over COVID, we were not able to go and see some of our clients. So it was a lot of time spent speaking to families and understanding what the needs are. Um, and again, it's all about connection as well. There isn't one organization that can do everything. So, you know, at our resource center, we're providing information to families and really providing a listening ear. And to have a social worker on the team is, is very important because uh, with COVID, what we found is there's been more complex cases in the community. Uh, whereas uh, individuals were going to retirement homes and long-term care homes. Now people are wanting to stay at home more. Um, so it's, it, it, is, it is complex, Shmal, and um, you know, it's continuous learning that we have to do and, and changing things all the time. Um, but person-centered care, I think, is, is very important, and I think more work is being done and more uh, organizations and hospitals, you know, within Canada are looking that as looking at that as well. Um, it's either called people centered care, emotional care. So there's different terminologies, which is being used, but it's actually person centered. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I do see a hand raised by Anna Maria. Would you like to unmute yourself? Okay, now, thank you very much. Anna Maria Cruz Valderrama here from Ottawa in Canada. 
Um, thank you for the excellent presentation. I was looking for <laughs> that presentation today. What I want to, uh, uh, to mention is that I am part here in Ottawa. We have one organization that is called Ottawa Grassroots and the Cultural Seniors Network is managed by the Social Planning Council of Ottawa. We are, uh, and it's because you mentioned about the importance of cultural background. This organization began over 90 years ago with the support of the Social Planning Council of Ottawa. We are over 25 in the cultural seniors organizations and we provide social, recreational, educational activities for seniors of over, over 3,500 across the city. Uh, COVID increased the social isolation in seniors, because we know that in Canada, social isolation has been a, a crisis, but COVID increased that crisis. We're very fortunate because uh, for over seven years now, the leaders of this organization, we meet every second week. So how we operate is that the social planning councils get grants and they allocate the resources to the different groups according to their needs and the numbers. But also we as an independent, we can apply with, uh, for funding. I am founder of the group is called New Beginnings and in the start with, uh, in response to COVID. Before I was working with other organizations, it was called Club Casa de los Abuelos, it's a, a Spanish uh, organization for Spanish seniors. Anyway, but what I want to say is that the answer also resides in us seniors. This organization are managed by seniors and 95% to 98% is managed by volunteers. We have one coordinator with the social planning council who is a social worker. It was not easy because our the rise of this organization was in response to the lack of the mainstream organizations that didn't know how to respond to our cultural needs. So we emerged out of need. Uh, I will say that it was not easy at the municipal level. At the federal level, we were, we were accepted at the provincial level as well. But thanks to COVID, finally the municipal level recognized us and it started to give us some funding because we never stopped. Technology was a problem, yes, but little by little seniors start to engage with, uh, have access to tablets. And now in the city, we have the $20 per month access to, to internet. So it's helping us. But the, what is important is how we are contributing to the public first, because keeping seniors active is very important to reduce social isolation, anxiety, depression. Mind you that I also, this organization in Toronto, there is an extra, two extraordinary organization. One is Dancing with Parkinson, who offers daily program for seniors, free of charge across Canada, for seniors with and without Parkinson. I have been with them for over two years. That's one. And also it now is funding to social and more social engagement because seniors across Canada, they want to talk, we want to talk. So they are facilitating that. To me, Dancing with Parkinson is a model of one organization that understands seniors, that care about seniors and move beyond the physical exercises. Okay, and the other one is um, that's one of my colleagues in the network is sharing dance. I haven't worked with them because I think in the pandemic, they work with videos. And for me, as I say all the time, even that is in some, I love to have a response, a reaction from the other side of the screen. You know what I mean? I having a tape. If I put a tape, I cannot talk to the Maria, Sorry okay. to interrupt. Um, in the interest of time, I would just like to ask, do you have a question for our yeah, speakers? The, my question is that, how we can promote more those social interaction with seniors across Canada. Great, thank you. Um, 
First of all, thank you, Anna Maria, for your input and information. And yes, you're right about the Parkinson's. I mean, there's the Alzheimer's Society. All these community organizations are, you know, providing a lot of free and wonderful programs. Um, I think um, how to get the word out. That can be very difficult sometimes. I guess it's it's advertising. I think word of mouth um, from uh, you know older persons or individuals that come to programs is sharing about information. Um, we do in Toronto have the two one one information line, which is very helpful. Um, but I find it mostly deals with the medical lens model. And what we need to find out is about all those uh, very um, wonderful programs that are happening in the community that are, are um, organized by people within the communities. That's what we're not finding out. So Mosaic has done a lot of so sort of senior advocacy groups and brought people together to have that discussion when we're talking about community mapping and micro mapping. That's when we're finding out of, of different programs around the city that we've never even tapped into or, or haven't heard about. So definitely word of mouth, um, you know, community agencies, collaboration, working together and talking about this and getting people interested um, and having very interesting social events. So it's not just about education all the time. It's something interesting and, and really listening to older persons in the community on what they want and, and you know, having surveys. That's where you're getting the feedback and conversation groups. So hopefully that answered your question. Thank you. I don't know if Jane has anything to comment on that as well. All right, thank you so much. I would like to now call upon Ms. Frances Zainodin to pose their question. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, thank you, Jane and Jane, um, for the wonderful presentation. Um, uh, it's wonderful to see all this going on um, and all these fantastic activities. But I am asking whether um, or oh, how these activities are funded um, and there's a lot of time spent on fundraising. I, I think in many programs, um, you know, it's so difficult to get the funding to, to push it forward and to maintain um, the activities. Um, and my second question is, um, do the participants pay a fee or do they just join for free? And actually I do have a third question. <laughs> Um, whether this is all part of the uh, age-friendly cities idea, um, you know, that was uh, uh, started by the, uh, the World Health Organization in terms of the age-friendly campaign, is that all connected? Thank you. I, I guess I can start. Thank you, Francis, for all your questions, all very important questions. Uh, yes, the funding. So as a private home care organization, it is very difficult to get funding, actually, and a lot of time and work. Um, we've, my business partner and I have created a model that we were able to uh, sustain and keep the programs going. Um, a lot of the people that we have coming to the programs um, you know, since it's for the community, sometimes they're not charging us for their time. Um, if we have tried to go for funding, which we did uh, for an art program, it was it just was very, very difficult. And, and the funders, I guess, were finding it difficult in understanding, well, how come a home care agency is doing this? Because it's not it's not the usual usually the private home care agencies are just focusing on the medical lens model, sending caregivers out, not really focusing on the person as a whole or implementing a person-centered care. So we've spent quite a bit of time and money. And this is, I think this is how Mosaic is, is really a benchmark in, in Toronto anyway for, for a model of care and and really working within the community, the grassroots of the community and working with community agencies as well, that it, it, it can't be siloed moving on. We, we have to be working together in order to create change. 
um, for the participants uh, for paying for some of the programs. Most of them are free. Um, if we're doing a larger event that, you know, there might be a charge to go in, we charge minimal. So we keep it um, at a low rate for people uh, to go in. There isn't a membership fee. Um, that might be something we could look at later on. But for now, for 12 years, we have been able to sustain that. Within the community setting and a lot of the not-for-profit agencies, they do apply for funding and, and it is a lot of work. They do get the funding, but what happens is, is that the funding uh, runs out or fizzles out and that program that people and organizations have worked on and the time and the staffing and the research, um, that program is done. So I think, I think we have to get better in collaboration and working together and, and uh, using uh, private uh, organizations to help with some of the community organizations as well. Um, the last question was age-friendly communities and age-friendly cities. And yes, we actually looked at a lot of work that was done in the UK. Uh, we looked at a lot of research. I mentioned uh, uh, Robin Dunbar that uh, worked on community and community assets and also the late John Cacchiopo uh, that worked on a lot of research on um, you know, isolation and loneliness. Uh, definitely looked at what the World Health Organization was doing. So, you know, some of the things that we've inputted into our model, um, you know, ha has looked at the research that has been going on and the creation of programs. And I think the importance of that social connection um, in which we are providing to communities. Hopefully that answers your question, Francis. Cheers, thank you. And for us, uh, we were funded uh, to do this project through the New Horizons for Seniors Grant, federal grant initiative provided us $25,000, which is pretty hefty um, to do these programs. Um, and yeah, we wouldn't be able to do them without federal funding. Uh, and of course we used um, Wood Green's own like local capacity um, and using some of their like salaried staff support. So that didn't come out of the grant. Um, but of course, grants are few and far between and difficult to get and you need grant writing skills, um, which is not, you know, super intuitive. So I don't have any tips, but just identifying barriers to actually making things happen. Um, I hope I wish there was more funding, but yeah, that's, <laughs> there's no tips there, just my feedback. I thank you so much. Funding is definitely a challenge to navigate, especially in the Canadian healthcare system. I would like to now move on to Mr. Tom Model. Would you like to unmute yourself and pose your question? Yes, um, thank you for your presentation and the work you're doing. Um, my question is at a higher level that as I perceive what you're doing in Toronto, which is a large metropolitan city, you're able to take advantage of the complexity of the networking that's available with various organizations and individuals. I happen to live in a, a small town 12 miles north of Boston, and uh, it's currently undertaking a huge revision of uh, community and particular adult services and so forth. And I think a lot of your methodology would be very interesting and we can discuss that offline, but um, have you experience in trying to apply your approach and methodology and framework to a non, sort of integral, large metropolitan area. Uh, Jane Armstrong, did you want to answer yeah. that? Thanks, Jane. Um, thanks for your question. So uh, we do a lot of work uh, with our American partners, especially AARP. I do see someone from AARP here, so that was exciting. Um, hi, James. Um, so we do a lot of work, like I said, with AARP, and we recently put out uh, the winter placemaking guide that had a focus on rural communities and how to do age-friendly placemaking in winter in rural communities that often think that because they don't have like identifiable town squares or large gathering spaces um, that they can't do placemaking. Um, it was placemaking generally but with an age-friendly lens. Um, so in the toolkit we talk a lot about asset-based community development I know I've spoken about a lot of assets lately, but pointed to a lot of examples of rural communities who have 
transformed main streets into um, like tubing events. Um, while that's maybe necessarily not geared towards seniors, it does speak to the ability of small towns to do a lot of age-friendly or at least placemaking initiatives. Uh, so I'll put a link to that in the chat. And Tom, I'll put my email too. Um, maybe I can put your question towards our executive director. I think we're this? already connected. I've sent an email oh, nice. to you via LinkedIn. Oh, okay, sorry. I don't check LinkedIn, but I will now. <laughs> okay, thanks, Tom. <laughs> Um, and I think, Tom, uh, thank you for your question, and I think you've reached out to me. Um, Mosaic has, you know, is mostly in the GTA area, so that's where we've been working. I haven't really sort of worked in, in the rural areas, but I have attended many conferences, and actually the one in um, BC, which was in April and May, um, the United Way of British Columbia is doing tremendous work and there's a lot of rural areas. And what I found at that conference was the magnitude of community agencies and linkages, um, you know, and because a lot of these, you know, individuals and residents were living in rural areas. Well, how do they connect and, and what do they, what do they do? I think perhaps in a lot of rural areas or farm country, you know, maybe they're connecting at their local churches, which are becoming community hubs or, um, you know, again, starting their their own groups and, and finding out other individuals that might be interested in that group. Um, so, you know, personally, I haven't done a lot of work in those areas, but I, I take the education from a lot of people around the table on the IFA and through other organizations as well and sort of learning how how that happens within other communities. So thank you. Thank you. I just, one closing comment. I, what you're talking about in terms of rural communities is enormously important, but there's a spectrum and I'm talking about small towns where Boston as a center of a half million people is surrounded by probably 20 or 30 or 40 communities comprising a population of seven or 8 million people. And the connectivity between the individual towns, which have a local sense of identity and so forth, with the larger community where a lot of the assets could be made access to, that involves a complexity that would impact your models, perhaps. And that I don't know if you've addressed that kind of an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, not as yet. Um, I, you know, again, it's it's very difficult, and I think you know the work that we've done is on the co community micro mapping where we're taking, looking at those areas that are within proximity of our, of our centers. Um, Toronto is huge as well. So there's no way, I mean, to do a proper micro mapping, you're needing a lot of research and staff. Um, and, you know, this is where collaboration comes in of community agencies working together. To try and do that but uh... i'll violate that i was not going to say any more but in the united states there are the village organizations of which there are about 308 uh, across the country and those organizations provide a, a network in and of itself in the small communities because those are grassroots organizations yes. you probably know yes very interesting well thank you tom for bringing that up yeah thank you so much I am now going to call upon Joan Cabana, whose hand is raised. Would you like to unmute yourself and pose your question? Hi, everybody. Um, I live in Galway, uh, in the west coast of Ireland. Um, we have uh, lunch clubs for our older people in the different uh, communities in both the city and the county. Um, now, these are organized by uh, volunteers in the, in the different communities. The meals are supplied by uh, a charity organization who has been doing this for many years in delivering um, meals. It was called Meals on Wheels uh, to um, people's homes. Um, now, this has proved to be very beneficial for older people because uh, they do simple exercises uh, before the meal. After the meal, uh, they can play cards or uh, they listen to music or maybe um, a speaker uh, would come in, somebody would come in to give them some uh, bit of information about uh, something. Um, 
Now, anybody who isn't able to um, get to the uh, launch club themselves, they are collected uh, by volunteers uh, in, in the community. Uh, now, the uh, older people uh, who can afford it, they do pay uh, a little, a very nominal amount for the meal. The meal consists, uh, really, I would call it a dinner. Uh, it's, it's, it's a main uh, plate. Um, it would have, uh, you know, meat and potatoes and vegetables, and they do cater for uh, anybody who has uh, specific needs, like vegetarians or that. They get a dessert and they get tea and coffee. So to me, um, it is a wonderful thing that happens in the communities, and the older people love it. So I just wanted to let you know that. No, very interesting, Joan. Thank you for sharing. I love hearing, you know, different models and, and different ideas from all around the world. And definitely the IFA brings that, uh, you know, every Friday morning and, you know, learning about what, you know, what, what can be done. And, and I think using volunteers because they make an impact, uh, you know, within communities and helping people as well. And again, you know, getting other community agencies involved, as you mentioned, Meals on Wheels and um, or, or friendly visiting or so forth. So all these things really help our communities. So thank you for sharing. We will then move on to the question from Dr. Barron. Oh, look, thanks, Servishi. But, um, you know, I think there's been so many rich questions and discussions. I feel a little bit... Um, um, Feel that my question is kind of uh, taking space but I'll quickly ask it. Jane it really is about the role of private sector um, and particularly in Canada you know there's a real tension around private sector involvement and the perception that you know private sector makes money and the not-for-profit sector doesn't make money well guess what that's wrong. Um, uh, the not-for-profit makes money because otherwise it wouldn't exist so I want to really ask you about the values of 880 cities and mosaics. Why do you actually even bother to do this? Because it seems to me that that's the heart of a question that we need to answer and understand to actually come together across sectors and disciplines. So it might be a bit of a tough question, but I think it's the elephant in the room. So over to you. Jane, do you want to answer that question first? And then I'll... Sure, I'll give it my best shot. Why we? Okay. <laughs> um, well, we started uh, as an organization by a really amazing person named Gil Penulosa, Guillermo Penulosa. You may know him. He does a lot of work with ARP as well. Um, who's actually running for mayor of Toronto <laughs> currently? Um, so he started his journey in Bogota, Colombia, where he was, I think, parks commissioner, um, and his brother was also in local government, um, and they've just made some amazing investments in a city that was pretty cash strapped that had a lot of socioeconomic issues um, they heavily prioritized BRT bus rapid transit they have like a leading system in the world now if you want to look that up in Bogota the BRT uh, and they also introduced the cyclovia which is like 1.8 I think kilometers of closed roads to cars every Sunday but open to people millions of people come out every year so we are just so empowered by the uh, potential of public space to be pedestrian first, to put seniors first, to put children first. Um, so that's sort of our reason to be. So, so really, it's it's yeah. whether you're private sector or not for profit, you're all focused on the same thing, which is improving yeah. quality. So Jane Teasdale, what are you? Why why mosaic? Why mosaic? Um, well, I've always been involved in the community, um, even prior to Mosaic, uh, wanting to see change. We looked at a lot of um, agencies and franchises within the private sector that we felt there needed to be something else. And we, need to, we needed to look at the empathy and um, more of a person-centered care model. So it was something that myself and my business partner were interested. Um, the money usually goes back into uh, it goes back into our organization to to run these resource centers and to run these programs. 
so, you know, I think people have this idea that, you know, people that are running private home care are raking in the money. And I can certainly tell you, <laughs> it's not, it's a lot of hard work. It's constant. It's thinking on your feet. It's how to work with other organizations. It's understanding the family. It's listening to the family. It's hiring the right staff and paying them well and appreciating the staff that you have. So our staff has remained with us, in-house staff, for, you know, you know, since COVID and prior to COVID. So we are absolutely lucky to have that team. And, um, and our community and our social engagement. I know that Lauren McNair, who has started with Mosaic, she's uh, on the line with me today. Um, she's working as community and social engagement. We're actually trying to get her in to do uh, social prescribing course as well. But it is very difficult as, as home care agencies and especially over COVID, a lot of uh, home care agencies uh, haven't you know, managed over COVID they're finding it difficult. Um, so I Thank think with you. Mosaic and working within the community is that we've been able to sustain our model. And okay. Thanks a lot, Jane. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for the thought provoking questions enriching our discussion today. I'm now going to introduce next week's speaker and I'll return to ask Ms. Teasdale and Ms. Armstrong for your takeaway messages. So please join us in the conversation next week with Ms. Nancy Siciliana, organization of the Niagara Stories Project, and Dr. Victor Cooperman, associate professor in linguistics at McMaster University. They will talk with us about the impact of storytelling on isolation in older adults. So join us next week, Friday, August 5th at 7 a.m. Eastern time to be part of this global cafe with Ms. Siciliana and Dr. Cooperman. Mm -hmm. Now, coming back to this important conversation, I'm going to start off with Ms. Teasdale. What is your takeaway message for today? And then over to Ms. Armstrong. Yeah, so basically, th thank you very much. And uh, thank you for all the questions as well. Wonderful to hear them all. Um, so this is actually a quote that I developed that I add into every presentation that I do for professionals and also for the community. And um, it's a world in which we can connect meaningfully, find meaning and identity and support, irrespective of age, support needs, culture, gender requires a much more connected, informed, inclusive, and integrated community. And thank you. <laughs>